Khan ended up in Vegas, a unique view of live events from someone who helps make them possible. She's had a hand in selling billions of dollars in show tickets, from concerts to boxing matches, and continues her passion of bringing people together despite a worldwide pandemic and the tragedy and loss she experienced surviving the Route 91 mass shooting. She's a jet setter, music lover, champagne enthusiast, and the founder of the hospitality and live event consulting solution, Kismet. Today, we have my very good friend, Rachel Villanueva with us. Thank you for being here. Of course. Thank you for having me. Yes. So tell us what brought you to Vegas, how long you've been here, a little bit about yourself. Uh, my parents brought me when I was maybe five years old. Um, I have no idea how long they intended on staying. Um, I just know that I'm still here. Um, what? 37 now. So the last, I don't know, my whole lifetime, basically. Um, they moved out here. My dad got a job opportunity that made more sense for us to move from Bay Area of California and um, kind of started school and did life and always thought I would move closer to the ocean or go do something else. And I don't know, you grow up. And I thought I was leaving for college. Um, I was supposed to go to UCSD. I wanted to be a bio major and go into genetics research. Um, there was a genetic disorder on my mom's side of the family that was always fascinating to me. And my senior year, I met a geneticist who was literally the most boring woman I've ever <laughs> met in my entire life. Um, in high school, I had danced and I had cheered and I was involved in all types of different like clubs and activities. And to see this woman sitting in a sterile office um, in a white coat, basically telling me you don't get to research the things you want. You research based off what has funding. Um, and she was miserable. I was like, yeah, so that doesn't really seem to fit my goal in life. And um, I told my parents, maybe I just won't go to school this first year. And that was a hard no. So I decided to do UNLV and was a business major and figured if I did international business, they encouraged you to study abroad so I could justify traveling internationally for school. Um, and I never left Vegas. I, I studied abroad in France, which was the probably best decision I made in college. Um, I worked full time, um, and I was working for an event planner and got to start touching events and then got into entertainment and got into live music. And it was just one thing leading to the next. And then, I don't know, just this city is one of those places that has everything at its fingertips yeah. and it's hard. I feel like for the last five plus, maybe even 10 years, I've looked at other cities and other opportunities and they don't compete with Vegas, um, at least in like the world that I'm in. So, yeah. Yeah. I think I can certainly relate to that. You go to other places and you compare everything to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that? I, I, I do, and there's things that I absolutely love about other cities, but from a personal and a professional standpoint, um, I care about hospitality, right. and we do it better than anyone else in the country, truthfully, probably the world. That's not to say there aren't incredible restaurants or incredible hotels or level of service somewhere else, um, but as a whole, the overall approach in this city is so dialed in and so that's where my expectations are and then we have that coupled with the ease and convenience mm -hmm. of getting to everything there's always something to do in this city whether that's on the strip or off the strip um and we also have an airport that happens to be dead smack in the middle of the city so if i'm flying into any other market majority of the time you're sitting in traffic for an hour we can land and 15 minutes be on the strip. I could be home in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, and I mean, cost of living for just your house and it could be newer, not a shoebox. in. <laughs> yeah. You do get spoiled living yeah. here, I think. Yeah. Very you know, spoiled. It's convenient, it's new, there's so much at your fingertips. 
uh, mm-hmm. shopping. I think we have almost the best of everything. We do. And I mean, I think getting older and realizing the impact of taxes mm. and fast forward to me setting up a company, having more flexibility than I've ever had in my life to go somewhere else. I'm like, oh, it makes so much more financial sense for me to be here and have my company based out of Nevada and rather than somewhere else. Yeah. So your business is is based here now. Tell us about the business that you have formed in the past couple of years. Prior to the pandemic, I ran the entertainment marketing team with MGM Resorts. So everything in our big arenas out here, so we have three, a theater, the festival grounds before MGM sold them. Um, so concert, sports, award shows, um, anything that was publicly ticketed. And then managing relationships with um, the tenants from the NHL or the WNBA. We, um, or like myself and my team, were responsible for marketing them or working alongside our promoters. We had hundreds of events a year. And then the pandemic hit and we went 14 months um, without having a publicly ticketed event in an arena where I was used to having some nights, three concerts in an arena, in three different arenas on the same night on top of everything else that was happening in the city. Um, So it just completely stopped. I sort of was like, what am I going to do with my life? Everything I worked for just disappeared. And it wasn't just me. It was the entire entertainment industry as a whole. Um, There's something about that chaos and the deadlines and high pressure environments that I thrive off of. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wanted to be in that still, but I didn't really know how. And never did I expect to be where I am now. And so I was looking for something and anything and applied for a ridiculous amount of jobs, I think like the majority of people Mm -hmm. and would make it until like the final two or final three, like head of artist relations for TikTok. Like it was, or for Twitch, it was, it was stupid, like amazing jobs. And it just wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm never going to work again. But like not in like the good way where you're swept off your feet. Um, And I had a friend introduce me to a restaurant owner that was getting ready to open up something here in Vegas. He has restaurants or the restaurant group has stuff in California and in New York and has been kind of throughout the country and and truthfully internationally as well. And I meet with them and I'm talking to them about marketing efforts. And then they tell me they want to extend me this job. I was like, oh no, I don't actually do restaurants. Like restaurants aren't my thing. (laughs) And then I knew very well, like in the back of my head, I would always just go back to MGM. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to take a job, especially when you can't pay me what I Mm -hmm. know that I would need. Like, yeah, that'd be great for a month or two, but I'm not going to screw you in a couple months as soon as my life goes back to normal. So the conversation came up about would I consider consulting for them, get them through their opening. And that was a lot more tangible for me to handle. So it was supposed to be a three month run. It kept getting extended. And within the first three months, I got a phone call from, or I had reached out to a former like boxing promoter that I worked with really closely at MGM because I saw an advertisement, I don't know, a lollipop sign or something and the day was wrong on it so let's say it was Thursday the 28th well Thursday would have been the 29th or something so I just shot a picture I was like hi I hope you're doing so well I happen to see this because I'm working on a project that happens to be at this property just so you know I think the hotel put up something that wasn't correct and that conversation started and found out and it's top rank boxing, which is a major boxing promoter from a national and and global standpoint. But they were struggling with the team that they were working with Mm -hmm. at the hotel. They just didn't have people that could speak the language of boxing. Boxing is crazy. It's crazy. Um, But it's figuring out what that cadence is for them, figuring out exactly where they needed to, um, 
drive their marketing efforts. Mm -hmm. So they had asked me if I had put together a small plan for them. And I was like, sure. She's like, just handle this and then deal with the property. Because I'd been on a property side before, but also could speak to the venue, could speak to the promoter side. And that sort of propelled. So in the meantime, I'm I'm getting ready to open up the first restaurant I've ever worked on in that sense. I'm planning a grand opening event, which for me was similar to what I was doing. But I also, I sat with the owners when they were asking me to put together budgets and their goal I think was a 10 million dollar a year restaurant like in revenue and I was like I don't know if that's a lot of money or not Mm. and I remember the restaurant owner and like the rest of the group being like what do you mean 10 million dollars is phenomenal for this type of thing and I was like well I don't understand like I don't know I can put together a budget for you but the last major fight in one individual event that I worked on for one night, we grossed $15 million mm-hmm. just in ticket revenue. Yeah. That wasn't anything incremental. That wasn't food and beverage. That wasn't pay-per-view. Right. That wasn't anything else. So you're telling me you hope that you make $10 million a year in revenue. Is that good or bad? Is that McDonald's? Is that Right. Luxury is that everything in between. Mm-hmm. So it was a this massive learning curve. Right. That sort of started conversations. Um, and then I'm doing random one off social media plans or marketing efforts and handling stuff with boxing. And it just kept sort of snowballing. But Nikki knows and I had several conversations with her and we have another really good friend that we actually went to high school with. They're just like, just do it on your own. And I was like, I can't really do this on my own. Like, I'm <laughs> starting to get really busy. At this point, I'm working on two more fights. Right. And everything else. But I was like, I'm going to go back to MGM. Like, i sure I dreamed about having a company. But, like, what does that really mean in the world that I'm in? Right. So it just kept moving forward. And there were more and more projects on my plate. And the restaurant group extended my agreement and extended my agreement. And I was like, oh, and for me, it was also getting to a point that while MGM was phenomenal and I learned so much, um, the culture and the environment for a lot of different elements um, didn't align. Mm -hmm. But also how do you walk away from something when it's literally everything you've dreamed about for the content that you get to work on. Right. So it was this constant internal struggle and being with this restaurant group, there was an email that was sent. It was, it was just kind of a nasty email. It was something petty and the CEO calls me and he's like, I want to make sure that you're okay. And at the time I'm like, I mean, I'm drinking wine on my balcony, but I'm not going to jump. <laughs> I don't, I'm like, I don't, I was like, what do you mean? Am I okay? And they're like, well, we just want you to know that this isn't appropriate. This isn't how we handle things. Da, 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 da. And we're going to be talking to those people. And I was like, wait, you actually care, care. about me? Mm-hmm. Like you care that this is how we're supposed to speak to one another. That it was the strangest thing. I, I, I've likened it to getting out of a toxic relationship mm-hmm. And you don't know how to act when someone's being nice to you. Right. When when they're not even being nice, they're actually just doing what they're being supposed to do. Human. Being human. Right. Yeah. And so there were all these little things that kind of just kept happening. And the restaurant allowed me to sort of get back on my feet. And I had a monthly retainer that kept coming in. And then I could touch boxing that was my world world that I knew extremely well. And this is all in basically February, March of 2021. So just about two years ago. By the end of 2021, um, Top Rank had had me working on fights on a national level, not just Las Vegas. I worked on 13 major fights. I worked with another boxing promoter, And they were large-scale fights. They weren't these tiny ones that happened to be in ballrooms. They were trilogy fights. They were in sold-out arenas. Um, They were back in my old space. I always thought I would be in live music. 
But because of MGM, I ended up taking on sports and I had this relationship with these people and they started having me work on things on a greater scale. The restaurant project was still going on. I took on another bar concept and things just kept starting hap- starting to like move forward. And my accountant kept being like, so hi, can we set up your LLC? Because you are going to get <laughs> screwed on taxes. Right. I understand that you keep saying this is slow and right. temporary, but financially like you need- it's not. Yeah. So perhaps you could start, <laughs> you know, being serious about this. And I think a lot of people don't, don't fall into it the way I sort of fell into it. And I'm super grateful that I did, but I was like, oh, I guess I have a company. <laughs> oh, like I, that first year, which technically was nine and a half, 10 months, mm-hmm. I billed more than my salary was with MGM. That's amazing. Yeah. Out, and I was like, oh, and then I learned all about like these expenses. <laughs> this is an expense yes. or this is this whatever. Is and I happen to still be in the world of food and beverage and entertainment. So my expenses are much more fun than a yes. lot of other people's expenses. <laughs> exactly. And so it just sort of happened. And then this entire year, I've worked on a ridiculous amount of boxing on a national level. That's amazing. Um, I leave tomorrow for New York for the ninth time this year. I pick and choose the cities that I want to go to that we have fights in, um, mostly because who wants to go to like Timbuktu, Iowa, when I could go to Manhattan or Dallas or wherever. Isn't it interesting? I don't know if you feel this way, but like sometimes you look back on your life and the experiences that you have and you realize like everything you've done has prepared you for this like moment or for where you're at. Absolutely. And it sounds like that for you. Like it completely is. And I think... 2020 was one of the hardest, most isolating, and yet satisfying years. Mm -hmm. And it forced me. I don't know if I would have left what was not the healthiest environment for me. Right. um, Because I loved what I was working on, unless I was forced to. I was in a situation very similar to yours where it was not necessarily toxic, but there were some relationships that were really unhealthy. And had I not been, you know, motivated to make a change, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And it's like almost like a blessing, Mm -hmm. even though it's bittersweet because you're in that moment where you're like, okay, well, I don't know what to, I'm not sure what's coming next. And that uncertainty, especially if you're Mm -hmm. hard driving and you've been working for a long time or your whole life, it's hard to know what to. Type A perfectionist that this is how I do my life. And I know what the plan is and I can be spontaneous on certain elements of my personal life, but when it comes to my career and when it comes to my goals, I'm not, I don't take risks like that. And this has been the most rewarding, scary, risk-filled decision I've ever made. And it almost didn't really feel like that because it just sort of kept snowballing. Right. (laughs) Um, But when, when my accountant was talking to me, he was like, okay, well, think about names. He goes, you don't even have to call your company that, but we could figure these things out later, but we need to form an LLC. I was offered an opportunity here in Vegas doing something sort of similar to what I had done before, more on the hotel side of things. And it was everything that I thought I had been wanting. It was the stability of having a regular income. It was health insurance it was a bonus at the end of the year and I was like this sounds miserable yeah like and I have to sit in an office again (laughs) yeah and I'm like but I have all these things lined up through the end of the year and I know I'm going to be in an okay situation and I had to give them an answer and when I was in when I was in college I studied abroad in France and I remember seeing this champagne bar And I had written down a couple of names that I really liked. And I was like, I'm going to randomly look up online and see if this is available because I'm not ready to commit to this job. And kismet, which essentially means meant to be, is another word almost for fate, um, was available in Nevada. 
So Kismet LLC, I was like, okay, I'm just going to get this. I'm mm-hmm. going to file the paperwork and I'm going to do all of the things. You're like, is this real? Is this like one of those great ideas that no one hel- else has oh, actually thought of right. before me? Because I feel like that's what you do in every decision. You're like, I have a great idea. And someone came up someone with it three times up. before me. <laughs> and I was like, it felt so right. Going back to you referred to like the relationship that you had working at MGM. Anytime you work somewhere for a long time, you feel a bond there. But you were at the Route 91 shooting. And so I'm wondering if you had, if looking back on it, you feel like maybe you almost had a trauma bond by staying there and being connected with the team that you had and the, you know, events that you were running because of how familiar that was to you. I think that that night, I don't think, I know, that was the most um, devastating or tragic night in my personal and my professional life. And it made me question everything. Mm-hmm. It made me not not sure how I could ever do what I did mm-hmm. um, as far as like my role from a marketing perspective is driving awareness to drive people to show up to to purchase tickets. So my job is to get twenty thousand people in in one space, right? And that was a really hard to reconcile mm-hmm. when I know that myself, I know that the team, I know anyone who was involved in producing it had nothing to do with like some evil person right. doing that. It just is we we put them there, right? So there's a weight of it and at the same time it's it it was just an interesting time in general it's Mm -hmm. it still is an interesting space to sort of live in as far as like a trauma bond I don't I can't say that I really think that's what it was and I think my relationship changed with the company I was there with because there was the entertainment team Mm -hmm that was so tight and so close. And I will forever be, cherish them. Mm -hmm. And then there's the rest of other things that I saw. Yeah. Um, And we were this tiny little pocket, but also I think in 2019, they had a $900 million a year. So you're not that tiny. You just are small, but mighty essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for me, personally I struggled with what I saw on the inside of a a corporation versus the outside of a corporation um I think other people have different experiences the way I looked at it it was really hard so for me I struggled with a bigger picture of how things were handled how people were valued conversations that were had in the immediate trauma after that event that I didn't feel like were followed through on. Mm-hmm. Um, so that for me was really hard. I don't think that I stayed or didn't stay because of that, but I'm super thankful to be outside of it because at the end of the day, you're just a number. You're not a person in a lot of situations. So that doesn't mean there's not incredible bosses and incredible people that pour into you and relationships that come from it, it means that they think they can swap you out at any given moment. And if they're making money, it works out, which is truthfully every major corporation along the way. For sure. Um, In your business now, how do you think your approach has changed um, from the past few years, from the shooting to COVID? Like you've probably learned, I'm guessing, so much about how has that just recolored how you look at events and planning things in the grand scheme of everything? Relationships and communication have to be extremely dialed in. I know that I wouldn't be where I am with my company. I wouldn't be working on the things that I'm working on without the relationships that I curated and developed over my time over the last 15 plus years in this city um, from a professional standpoint. And 
I think I'm more aware of that that there are concerns across the board. I think what we've seen, especially from the pandemic, is how massively divided people are. And yet at times, if you can provide an event from a music standpoint, from a sporting standpoint, from any of these different things, people can kind of let go of those disagreements because they're captivate, captivated by that moment. Mm-hmm. It's my favorite thing about live events being able to walk into a venue and watching people fall in love, watching people cry, watching people create that memory. And you had an element in that. It's, a, I guess, a little bit a play on your ego, um, but it's also there's just this energy that mm-hmm. happens in live events, and there's something really magical about that. You've been to thousands of events in Las Vegas and all over the world. Tell me about like one of the most nostalgic Vegas experiences that you have had. Maybe it's not related to one of the events mm-hmm. that you've worked. Um, the year that I turned, well, I have, I have a handful that like popped up, but the year that I turned 30 and not to, I don't know, it sort of sounds kind of crazy, but I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do for my birthday and everything else. Um, I said, why don't I do 30 performances for my 30th? So that entire year, I sort of made this hashtag, which is funny because I don't really ever post. I mean, I post a little bit on social. I'll post on stories, but I'm not a big like grid person. Um, I went to 30 different concerts or plays over the course of the year, and all but two were not my shows. Um, they were ones that I got invited to ones that I went to that were at other people's venues, um, some traveling, one was a Broadway play, et cetera. Um, and so that was just a year that I kind of poured myself into that and it, and then I kept a whole entire list. And at the end of the year, I said, these are all the different ones that I went to. And then I got my friends to be part of it. And they were like, where are we on our 30? Like, (laughs) it was so much fun. Did Um, you go to some of those alone? No. I always was with, always with friends. And I think I'm so lucky that there was always someone that wanted to go to some type of event or was inviting me to something. But you go to events alone sometimes. I will. Yeah. Yeah. And um, more because so that if- I know this because she asked me last minute to go to Sam Hunt <laughs> and she got to enjoy it all I by did. herself. <laughs> I did. Someone asked me if I wanted to go and I was like, okay. It was like a Tuesday. <laughs> it was a Tuesday, four o'clock. I was like, I have to pick up my kids. The adult. <laughs> Um, I'm more like, or I'm, and I think some of that is getting older too, is just being sure of yourself enough to be able to show up somewhere. I will say the city is extremely small, so it's very unlikely you're not going to run into someone that, you know, um, having been in that entertainment space for as long as I have been in live event space for as long as I have been, you have your regular suspects or your usual suspects that are there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to run into someone. I'll be like, Oh, okay. So you get to go. Um, I don't think I ate alone at a restaurant until it was definitely in my mid thirties. And now I'm like, who cares? I want to eat the food. I want to go have the drink. I am a huge bar seater, especially when I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's harder in your own city than it is when you're gone. Yeah. Um, I'm just like, okay, well, that's what I'm in the mood for. And that's what I'm going to do now. So I think that speaks so much to her business because Kismet is exactly that. And I think that you leave so much room in your life open for like what's going to just walk into your life to happen. And I want that adventure. I want that next thing that I'm chasing. There was a trip I took in 2018 and the only thing I planned was this like one day, but I had two weeks of like, okay, well, I know where my flights are. I know where my hotels are, but that's it. And it was hands down one of the best trips and I went by myself. I've traveled a lot more on my own than I've gone to individual events, which I guess is kind of silly. Cause like I'll get on a plane and go to Europe by myself. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> but 
to go to a concert, I'm like, well, we'll see, but I'll probably run into someone. Um, I'll travel. And I'm like, I don't care if I don't see a single person I know. It doesn't matter. I'm getting to do all the things that I want to do. It's um, kind of a nice opportunity to do what you want without having to wait for anyone else or be have to compromise with anyone else. Then you get to learn and you get to see so many other people's way of life and their perspective and finding that joy um, that they have. I think it's why I say the the best decision I ever made in college was studying abroad. It was recognizing that while, yes, the U.S. has so much more than a lot of other places, it's not the only way to do things. Mm -hmm. And it's not the only way to be happy. And being and spending a significant amount of time in other places, realizing how hard and how much we work here Mm -hmm. isn't only it. I've loved what I've done for as long as I have because people always talk about their work life and their personal life. Well, my work life and my personal life are so tied together. Yeah. Um, very much so. And I'm I'm happy with that. Like, I don't know what it would be like to, like, I could never, like, market a vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. like, I love this shark so much. Please click on the link below. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that sounds terrible. And yeah. then you, like, close it off and you leave. I mean, there are days that I'm like, I wish I didn't have to talk to these people. I wish that I could shut it off. And I think owning your own business, you don't. There's, You can set up boundaries, but at the same time, I would say the majority of my week, I will wake up and I will be lucky if I'm not looking at emails before I get in the shower. Yeah. And then half the time I'm taking a call in a towel because something urgent is happening. Mm -hmm. Maybe I get through blowing out half of my hair and then I'm on (laughs) two other calls or a text message or an email or something else. You just sort of fit it in. Mm -hmm. But when you're working in different time zones, that's just life. Yeah. And I have to answer it. Otherwise, like it's not going to get done. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like waking up at the train has already left the station. And I feel like you just start running to catch up with Mm -hmm. it. And like the slower you run, the harder it is going to be to like catch up (laughs) finally when you're like, oh my gosh, it's noon. What's going on in the day? (laughs) It's crazy. So, okay. So if you're um, home on a Sunday in Las Vegas, the weather is perfect out Describe in vivid detail what you are doing. There's definitely wine or champagne involved. Potential for happy hour. Um, I'm probably in a pair of leggings and sneakers. And um, it's it's one extreme or the next. It's that I'm going to catch up on whatever shows I recorded that last week or three weeks that I haven't had a chance to watch or binge something on Netflix and just try and tune out everything or I am texting someone, where are we going to brunch? What are we going to do? I've flown home many a time that I'll land at 1030 in the morning from the East Coast. And I'm like, am I tired? Am I not tired? I'm like, ah, I'm going to text someone. We're going to go to brunch. I can be at brunch at 11. And somehow that 11 o'clock turns into (laughs) 11 p.m. And we are going for the next 10 or 12 hours, bouncing from one place to the next, um, eating great food along the way, drinking too much rosé. I don't know, probably listening to music too loud and just having fun. But What's your favorite brunch spot? Not to put you on the spot. I, don't know. I do love DW. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think old favorite. It's so yummy. Um, there's a handful of places, though, that I think are are really good. Um, if I'm on the strip, I love Lakov at Wynn. Um, I'm a sucker for French restaurants and a quiche and a French onion soup. So mm-hmm. Bouchon or Mon Ami, and then you get like the view of the fountains, I think is always really fun. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I don't really like breakfasty food mm-hmm. very much. Oh, breakfast is my favorite meal by far. So I like breakfast more for dinner okay. than I do in the morning. The first meal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just, I remember growing up and my mom would tell us that we could have 
breakfast for dinner and we'd either have um, Belgian waffles or the, she used to have these Russian pancakes, which are basically like crepes. And it was mm-hmm. like the biggest treat, which is so funny because I'm like, I mean, I think it was at, now as an adult, I'm like, oh, it's because you just didn't <laughs> want to make something else. I'm like, this is really fast. And yeah. really easy. But it was so good as a kid. I just, I don't know. Sometimes I think it's like a little much as that first meal. And yeah. so I think that's why I don't love I mean, if I had a choice, it'd be just sham. We could just drink champagne for brunch. Yeah, or only drink wine. Like a diet. Yeah, for I, sure. I, it'd be all for that. Maybe an avocado toast on the side. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us on our podcast. Uh, you're our first guest, by the way. Oh my gosh! So this is my first podcast ever, hence why I was so like, oh god. What what am I gonna do? <laughs> but we really appreciate you coming in and telling us about your business and telling us a little bit about your history in Las Vegas and giving us really good uh, advice on where to go. I haven't been to half of those places, have you? Um, some of them. Yeah. DW Bistro is like right over by, it, there's only one, right? Yeah. yeah. Moved a couple they times. had an old location and then they moved. Around. And there was a French oh, yeah. restaurant in their old location for a minute. And then it, yeah. Andre's, I think. And then it was good. Cl- it was so good. And then really it closed. Good. So do, what side of town do you live on? I am currently in Anthem. I um, was in Henderson sort of when I grew up mm-hmm. um, and then was in Mountain's Edge, like Southwest mm-hmm. for a really, really long time. Yeah, I've been in Anthem for about a year and a half. Yeah. We feel like it seems like the people tend to gravitate to like one part of town or another. Do you have like a preference or you've lived here your, most of your life? So do you feel like you like one set of town more than the other? Or I am definitely more your Summerlin or Southwest person. Okay. Um, As are we. <laughs> yes. uh, My girl. There's a lot. And I've actually sent Nikki a handful of things. Like I not so much downtown where it's like arts district Mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff but there's a neighborhood right off sahara near valley view that Mm -hmm. i absolutely love Mm -hmm. there's a couple neighborhoods in town that i think have this um a little bit more mature landscaping this like old school Mm -hmm. kind of feel that feels a little bit more unique than your cookie cutter like houses which is funny because i always thought that was normal because i grew up here right and then the more you travel and i'm like there's not really any history in our houses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I like that a little bit more. I'm all for being more central. So I know Summerlin sometimes can be far or Anthem can be far, whatever. To me, it's just like, okay, what's the easiest to get to the strip, get to the airport, get to my friends. It's been hard this last week and I've gone back and forth on what I'm going to do next. But all last week, I'm, I'm working on a project at Red Rock Casino that we're going to oh, okay. open up um, in March, which is going to be everyone's new favorite spot. I'm very excited about. Um, but high-end cocktail bar and lounge and this whole thing, I'm really excited. Um, well, we'll have to put those that, those details in the show notes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but to go from Anthem to meetings at Red Rock – three days in a row and then today having to go back over there you're sitting at a 30 35 minute drive and probably 16 of those minutes are driving down eastern well a lot i was just gonna say a lot of people would rather do anything more than drive down eastern yeah so it's gotten really bad um we get we're really lucky here and i was living so i live over in the southwest kind of over bishop gorman do you know that is Mm -hmm. and i was commuting to green valley and i was taking another job and I was like well I don't really want to commute from here to Green Valley every day and the division president was like had moved here from Atlanta and he was just like roll his eyes at me I'm like I'm sorry I don't want to spend 40 minutes a day going each way driving or 35 I you know I think it goes back to the convenience that this Mm -hmm. city has yeah is that other cities people are used to an hour two hour commutes we're not we're not okay with it we're it's just not what we do in this city right for the most part i think you can get anywhere here in about 20 25 minutes Mm -hmm. um i think we've been spoiled in that way extremely spoiled i think the more that we see coming here and i'm so excited about it more sports teams started with obviously the wnba team but hockey i think was the first real like impact you saw driving crowds and that sort of thing and then football and as we're taking on other teams the difference with 
us is that we are so condensed to like where those major events are happening. The majority of them are happening on the strip. So all of a sudden it takes so much more time to get to these places. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing it just more people are moving here. So traffic is getting worse, but then I sit in LA for something and it takes me 45 minutes to go a quarter of a mile. Yeah. And I'm pissed off the entire time. And I was like, I guess it's not quite that bad then. So yeah, yeah. it just varies. But it's nice. We, you kind of think about that where you, where you want to plant yourself because it's really important. It's a quality of life thing, I think. Yeah, it is. And I think a little bit as to what we talked about before is just, I'm lucky that I did grow up here. I have such a strong group of friends. Mm-hmm. I'm also lucky that my friends are not just the people that I worked with. I have friends who are in every different industry. I have friends that own their own businesses that have your traditional jobs that have jobs they hate that are stay at home moms now or everything in between. And I have a lot of friends that are like, you just have so many different pockets of friends and I do. And I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so as much as I thought I wanted to leave and be in another city, I think it was more that I needed to change my work environment Mm -hmm. that allows me the flexibility to go and visit. And now I have friends in all these other cities as well that I, I have my routines like Mm -hmm. go to New York. I know exactly what coffee shop I like matcha I'm getting in the morning and this is where I'm going and this is where I'm doing. And I love to stop into this bar, but then I get to come home and I have this very diverse group of friends and really strong women that I get to do life with. And I think if we lived in a city with worse traffic, if you had that, you, you deal with the crappy traffic. Um, we just don't have as bad a traffic and at least we can have really big closets. Like, <laughs> yeah, people, seriously. So. Absolutely. A closet. Yeah. Well, I think it's kismet. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, Rachel. Of course. It was really a pleasure getting to know you and, and hearing your story. I'm excited to see what stuff you do and where things go for you. Yeah. Thank you.